I will be talking about Natching, the tool of choice to steer energy consumption, question mark, uh, because um, I was asked basically to provide some critical food for thought as well. Besides, I think we're using the word Natching in a very different way, so uh, don't take it too personal. Well, I'd like to start with a small anecdote. So uh, I was checking the year in which uh, the book Nudge of Tyler and Sunstein was published using my Safari browser. So I typed in Nudge and I was directed to the webpage nudge.com and it warned me my data were not safe, so it would be taken away. So I, basically, it tells you everything about it. So. Back in 2008, Tanner and Sunstein suggested nudging would be a great new way to improve health, wealth, and happiness. The method was euphemistically called liberal paternalism. That means the nudger would be like a caring father, while the nudged one would have all the freedom to decide otherwise, even if he or she was tricked or not even noticed he or she was nudged. People would be helped by companies or the state with subconscious nudges to correct their so-called misbehavior. This earned Richard Tyler the Nobel Prize, but not Cass Sunstein, who had written a critical book in the meantime entitled The Ethics of Influence. Let me say up front that I don't see a problem with putting the ecological energy mix on top of a choice list or to label it green energy. This is pretty harmless. People understand this trick, but often agree anyway. I'm also not against use of big data or artificial intelligence. On the contrary, use it for good things, but the question is how to do it well. Nobody told us, however, that we would be nudged every day, all the time, with personalized information that is tailored to us with personal data that was collected about us mainly without our knowledge and agreement, effectively by means of mass surveillance. And this big nudging, which combines nudging with big personal data, must be criticized as it undermines the very basis of our democracy, self-control and human dignity. Let us look back for a moment. Already in the 60s, the first climate studies by all companies pointed out that there is a negative effect of carbon-based energy on climate. But for a long time, it seems nothing was done to change this. Then in the early 70s, the Limit to Growth study warned us that in a world with limited resources, we would sooner or later run into an economic and population collapse. No matter how the model parameters were changed, the prediction said humanity was doomed. The Global 2000 study commissioned by US President Jimmy Carter basically confirmed these predictions. However, it was again assumed that we would not change the system of equations, that mean the socioeconomic system we live in. Finally, the United Nations established the Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, pressing for urgent measures towards a sustainable planet. So there are 12 years that we have for this. So 50 years after our sustainability problem was diagnosed, is big nudging the solution to our sustainability problems? Should companies digitally steer the behaviors of the people? This kind of assumes that companies would be the good guys who do the right things and should therefore have all the conceivable freedoms. In particular, they should develop, produce and sell products as they like. The people in contrast would be the kind of bad guys who show misbehavior, as Richard Tyler would call it, and whose behaviors would therefore have to be corrected and controlled. What would this mean? Let me give two examples. The above approach foresees that producers of, for example, sweet lemonades would sell a lot of unhealthy products and advertise for even more consumption of it, while our health insurance would give us minus points for buying and drinking lemonades and charge us higher tariffs. The car industry would go on selling as many cars as they could, but politics or some citizen score would forbid most of us to use them most of the time. 
So the diesel scandal, which will forbid many car owners to use their cars in central parts of many cities, would be just a precursor of what is to come. Does such a model make sense? I'm not convinced. Are you? So, is the proposed solution, which comes under names such as profiling, targeting, neuromarketing, persuasive computing, big nudging and scoring, really our savior? Unfortunately, as advanced as these technologies may be, they tend to be totalitarian in nature. The Ch Chinese citizen score, for example, has been heavily criticized by all major Western media. But the situation in Western democracies is not so much different. Tristan Harris, who worked in a control room at Google, where public discourse was shaped, recently exposed the mind control of billions of people that a few tech companies exert every day. Moreover, if one traces back the actors and history of the underlying technology and science, we end up in the 1930s of uh, last century with their infamous behavioral experiments. This links to fascist times and thinking doesn't make things better. How could things come that far? We are living in a society which thrives on the combination of two very successful systems, capitalism and democracy. Unfortunately, this model is not good enough anymore. It hasn't created a sustainable future. And so, as I have pointed out before, our world is heading towards a doomsday scenario if we don't change our system. Unfortunately, also, neither the public nor scientists were informed well enough that in the past 50 years, we should have done nothing else than reinvent society. Furthermore, unfortunately, Democracy and capitalism today do not have aligned goals. Capitalism tries to maximize profits, that means a one-dimensional quantity, while democracy should continuously increase human dignity, that means strive for multiple goals, including knowledge, health, well-being, and opportunities to unfold individual talents. These are two totally different things. So everyone should have understood that if we did not manage to align the goals of both systems, one system would sooner or later crush the other system. It recently often appears that it is democracy that would be crushed. Let me shortly talk about the new kind of data driven society that was created. We now have a, a new monetary system, which is based on data. Data is the new oil. This data is mined by what we call surveillance capitalism, where people are the product. We also live in a new kind of economy, the attention economy. People are flooded with information. Attention became a rare good which is marketed among companies. This allows them to influence people's consumption, opinions, emotions, decisions and behaviors. We further have a new legal system. Code is law. Algorithms decide what we can do and what we can't. They are the new laws of our society, but these are not passed by our parliaments. Altogether, this has also led to a new political system for companies such as Cambridge Analytica, Facebook and Google manipulate the choices of voters and thereby undermine democracies and the free, unbiased competition of ideas. A digital sector enabled by big data and big nudging would now allow to steer society and correct the claimed misbehaviors of people as it is currently tested in China. This brave new world was created without informing and asking the people. We have been sleepwalking, but we are discussing these developments now and that's why democracy will win. What do we need to do now? We must build democratic capitalism. This means to democratically upgrade capitalism and to digitally upgrade democracy. We need information platforms and technologies which have our constitutional, societal, cultural and ecological values inbuilt. We call this approach design for values. And it's coming. The IEEE the biggest international association of engineers is already working on standards for ethically aligned design. What does design for values mean for our society? 
that the democratic principles that means the lessons that we have learned over hundreds of years in terrible wars and bloody revolutions would have to be built into our technologies. This includes human rights and human dignity, freedom and self-determination, pluralism and protection of minorities, the division of power, checks and balances, participatory opportunities, transparency, fairness, justice, legitimacy, anonymous and equal votes, as well as privacy in the sense of protection from misuse and exposure and the right to be left alone. How to enable informational self-determination in an age of big data? Assume every one of us would have a personal data mailbox where all the data created about us would have to be sent. The principle to be established would be that we decide who would be allowed to use what data, for what purpose, period, time and price. An AI-based digital system would help us administer our data according to our privacy and other preferences. Uses of personal data, also statistics created for science and politics, would have to be transparently reported to the data mailbox. With this approach, all personalized products and services would be possible. But companies would have to ask in advance and gain, gain the trust of the people. This would create a competition for trust and eventually a trust-based digital society in which we all want to live in. Furthermore, we would have to upgrade our financial system towards a multi-dimensional real-time feedback system as it, as it can now be built by means of the Internet of Things and blockchain technology. Such a multi-dimensional incentive and coordination system is needed to manage complex systems more successfully and also to enable self-organizing, self-regulating systems. So, assume we would measure on separate scales the externalities of our behavior on the environment and other people, for example, noise, CO2 and waste produced or knowledge, health, and the reuse of waste created. Suppose also that people would give these externalities a value or price in a subsidiary decision process. Then we could build our value system into our future financial system. I call this system the socio-ecological finance system. People could then earn money with recycling. Companies could earn money for environmental friendly or socially responsible production. In this way, new market forces would be unleashed that would let a circular and sharing economy emerge over time. Personally, I don't think there are not enough resources for everyone in the world. We don't have an overpopulation problem. Our problem is rather that the organization of our economy is outdated. I think we're living in a time where we have to fundamentally reorganize our society and economy in the spirit of democratic capitalism, based on the values of our society. I'm also convinced that energy won't be the bottleneck, but we will have to take new avenues in the past, the focus was often on big solutions which would produce energy for a lot of people. I propose that we should focus more on solutions which are oriented at decentralized, local and more democratic energy production. Modern physics knows that our universe is full of energy. In fact, it is totally made up from energy. It wouldn't be plausible to assume we could not learn to use it. I expect that a more democratic production and use of energy, goods and services will lead our society to an, to an entirely new level. It is high time to focus on this transition and how we can accomplish it together. The instrument of City Olympics, the means of competitions of cities for sustainable and resilient open source solutions to the world's pressing problems, could help us find the way. Thank you.